What's up? We stand an on-time king. Come on, man. We ain't playing. We stand an on-time king. Like, this is the most non-CP interview I've had thus far. I'm a, I beat your fan base. Look, there's only 10 people on there right now. I came here before they did. You a real one. You a real one. <laughs> but that's, that's I, all I expect from a Howard brother. You know what I'm saying? That's all, What you eating? Protein bar. Okay, okay. Because cause we have to... been seeing the figure man. in the boys has been real, real brolic. I'm trying to do something, man, because this COVID, I've been eating. I ain't been working <laughs> out. The gyms are closed. <laughs> I'm like, man, do I really want to work out outside in 113 degree heat? Oh, yeah. Like, LA is wild right now. LA has been a mess. Ooh. A hot mess. And New York has been a mess, too, because... No gyms were open. Mm. So, yeah. I'm well, I'm glad to know. Listen, if Laz Alonzo is struggling, then Leah can struggle and not feel away. I'm so over COVID. Yo. You have no idea. We, you know, we don't, and, and we don't get all into that. But before we start, I do have to shout out my cousin Shamika because she is a huge fan. And she always said, the next time you talk to Laz Alonzo, tell him and shout me out. So, Shamika. Hey, Shamika. Say hi, Shamika. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Okay, so so what have you been up to? Because I was actually surprised that the boys came out because everything has been put on hold. So when did y'all film that? The boys came out this past Friday. Mm -hmm. We filmed that last July oh. to November. So we were done November of 2019 with this season. Oh. But it usually takes like a good like seven to eight months. Mm -hmm. to do all the editing, all the special effects. I was going to say, because the special effects are crazy. Yeah, the music. Um, they have to, like, dub it in, like, a couple hundred different languages. Oh. Yeah, so that's... Because, I mean, you are, y'all y'all are Amazon Prime's number one show globally. Right. You know, as we can brag on our stuff, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to that Howard brother right there. Hey, you, you know... Period poop, period poop. Don't get me ratchet. I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> not yet, not yet. But yeah, good? no, congratulations on that, Thank though. You. I think it's super dope. And I, you know, I told you that I'm not really into the superhero type uh, sphere. It's not really my type of lane. But I was pleasantly surprised to watch this weekend. I caught up on season one and what we have so far in season two. And I was actually entertained. So it's a good show. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the show is meant to really try to um, shake people up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we're not worried about offending people. Yeah, for you know, sure. It, it's, we we want to stimulate conversation, and we want to. Obviously, it's a superhero show, but mm -hmm. so you're still gonna have you know crazy things happening and right. running fast and laser beam eyes. But mm -hmm. we also want to anchor them in like a sense of reality. Yeah, how we're dealing with the world as we know it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so even though it's superheroes, you're still going to see a lot of uh, topics that mm -hmm. we're discussing today. You know, oh, yeah, racism, for sure. Yeah, racism, narcissism. Sexual assault, Me Too movement. Me Too movement, which was last season. This season mm -hmm. really touches a lot on racism. Ooh. You know, so, you're, yeah, you're going to, you know, it's they, they try to anchor it in reality. Mm -hmm. And so I well, think that's why people mess with it so much. Well, and I thought it was interesting because your character's name is Mother's Milk, but Homelander was never mind. Let me not. I know. That. Let I me. Know. Speaking I of know. Mother's Milk, and for all those people who've been watching, y'all know what I'm saying because I was like, e okay. I ain't gonna lie though. I'm glad my character doesn't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> it's not a weirdo. Because <laughs> in the comic, in the comic, he needed his mother's milk to live. Who Homelander? No, Mother's Milk. Oh, that's where the name came from. In the comic, that's where the name came from. Oh, that's gross. Yeah, so uh, his mother worked in a factory for mm. Boss. And it was a factory that produced Compound V. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, like, have safety measures for their factory workers. So all their factory workers got sick. And they caught... You know, they call almost like a cancer from this compound mm -hmm. V working in, in a factory up in the Bronx. 
Okay. And because um, Mother's Milk is from Harlem, but this factory was in the Bronx. And so all the people in that area mm -hmm. got sick, including Mother's Milk's mom. She was pregnant with Mother's Milk while she was working in that factory. Mm. Now, if you know anything about New York and where they discard their trash in New York, all the trash that's produced in the island of Manhattan and in New York mm -hmm. City gets taken up to the Bronx, Bronx. to get burned. Hence, the Bronx has the highest uh, number of children with asthma in all of New mm. York City. Wow, I didn't know that. Gee, I wonder what the correlation is there, right? <laughs> Obviously, right. That they're, yeah, they're burning all this trash in this one area that only affects people of color that live in the Bronx. Right. You know? So uh, that was kind of the parallel with Mother's Milk and that factory, and she was pregnant with Mother's Milk. So when he was born... He was born addicted to compound V, which was in her blood. Wow. And the only way he could get it was from her from suckling. It. Yeah. But the thing is, is uh, unlike, you know, it was, it was almost like a crack baby. <laughs> yeah, right. That's really what he was. He was a crack baby, but instead of crack, it was compound V. Right. Thing is, is he needed that to live. It gave him supernatural strength, which is why he's always so big and buck. And you, oh, but if he went too long without drinking his mother's milk, he would die. Wow, that's interesting. They yeah, are so we gonna see any that, of that implemented or nah? That's nah, not not on our show because in our show the creator didn't want any of the boys to have powers. Powers. He wanted us to be regular men mm -hmm. who just risk our lives, right? Because of the fact that we wanted to, you know. Avenge right, the wrong. Right, yeah. right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? And so that that was he felt it was more interesting if we didn't have powers. If we had powers and it's just another superhero show, superheroes right. fighting each other. And right, right, right. So you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Well, no, it, it it does make a difference, but I think that's why I said like I watched it and I wasn't like uh I'm bored or another right. superhero. Da da da. It was I I liked the cussing. I liked right. you know the really graphic nature. I wasn't expecting like the first. 30 seconds of the show lets you know um, how how Huey's girlfriend you oh, know, yeah. meets her maker. Jesse All that. Did that. I'm trying not to give it away because I do want people to go watch it because it is a good show and I don't want to ruin it. But yes, um, so it, that is one of the things. Now, <laughs> I will say I, I watched, I sat and watched both seasons this weekend. And one of the comments that Mother's Milk made i just wanted to see if this is like a line with last because i know you guys have some similarities like the ocd you know he was talking about playing with some toes with his girl in season one so i just wanted to know you know what i'm saying if last is a toe man you know what i'm saying man yeah. so i don't think there's anything wrong every now and then if you want to have some fun with some toes okay okay but no i'm not zone. one of those creepy dudes that's gonna slide in your dm and be like can you send me a picture of your feet? Okay. That right. ain't me. Okay. Because yeah. I have a few friends that tell me that a lot of the DMs they get are men I'm requesting totally feet. Have you gotten that? N no, I haven't gotten that. But I, I tell you, that's like the fine line between me and OnlyFans. Because wow. there's, there's a market. There's a market for it. Right. If I can show a toe, you don't know Leah, Leah's limited. You don't know none of that. Just put a little toe out there. Last. There's I think money you might to have made. to do a toe, a toe only fans page. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you the content and tell me what your boys think. Tell All me, right. tell me what your boys think. I might, <laughs> I might just put you on my story, and have a little vote. <laughs> no hell no. <laughs> just, let's do it. Let's do it. You want to be only fan? Let hey, let's do a survey. Okay, but like another Should thing, she open talk? an only fans page for her foot and have no, a okay, picture but listen. of your toe. I'm not gonna lie though. So I, sorry, and this is supposed to be about you, but since we're on the topic, this is why me and you can't get together because we go quick. So ahead, you were about to confess something. I, I was okay. So you know, I'm single and I'm on these dating websites, right? And you think that like these niche dating sites are like, you know, for whatever you're into. So as a plus size woman, I'm thinking like, okay, let me go get on something for plus size people. Yo. <laughs> Yo, yo, last. Oh, no. I had to happened? go. My nigga, they have shit talking about 
are you a feedy, a feeder? Or do you like to be smashed? Are you a smashy? Like, there's categories for shit, for people, like, for fat people. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you, you could be a skinny man who likes to be smashed, and that's something that turns you on. And for me, Smash. like, bruh, taking my body weight and smashing you with it is a turn on for some, oh. but it's a category, which means that there are people who identify with this sexual type of okay thing I, I mean i don't know it for me was a little too far because you know quite frankly i want a man who is interested you know who likes my body right but i also don't want to be like a fetish to you right like so enjoy the way right. my body looks but like i don't want like i had a, another fat friend she was a big girl she met a dude on this website and he used to like feed her on purpose so like you could be full and he could be like you want pizza do you want chicken wow <laughs> and, I, and i'm not i'm not here for that because like so you know so, but here, here's a question though here's a question Okay. Uh, is it, why shouldn't you be, let, let's take weight out of the equation, right? Okay. Let's just look at it from an attractive, attraction perspective. Okay. Wouldn't you want to be your man's biggest fetish? Yes, but. You, you know what I'm saying? So yes. let's say, let's say, let's just say, hold on. Okay. Let's say your man, his one of the things that turns him on are braids. Mm -hmm. Braids is like mm -hmm. that's his thing. Right. If you look at when he was a kid growing up, a picture on his wall, the woman would have braids. Like that's right. one of his. We can call them fetishes, or we can call them turn on. His turn ons, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So you are wearing braids. And now he's just obsessed. Like you could tell, like he's like really turned on by them. Right. Do you think that it's the it's the braids or it's you in braids? You know what I'm saying? But, there but, is, I but think there's a line. Right, but but having a fetish means that any girl with braids is gonna do it. Any what girl with braids, right. Right. So like any girl who could smash a man is gonna do it for him. Like I don't, I don't want to go on a date and we're having casual conversation and you is really turning you on for me to eat just because I'm fat. Like I don't, I don't want that shit. Right. Yeah. No. I hear you. I hear you. I think. I think. Like. Um, like listen, the reason why I was home. asking you, the reason why I was asking you was because what if that is his genuine preference? Like what no, if that's what really it turns is. him on? It is, but it, I don't. I don't want that to be the only thing. Like, could you not just be? Because, uh, like, let's be clear. Men have preferences, right? Like most, most. You know, right now the body shape is the uh and the ass with the boom, and 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 people are feeling that, and that's their thing, right? So then, is that a fetish? Is that a fetish too? Well, but I think there's a fine line between fetish and 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 preference. No, because like I, 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 I don't. I'm not disputing that at all. But my question is. When does it go from fetish to genuine attraction? Like, where is the line between? Well, there fetish? could be both. No, like, I'm genuinely uh, attracted to you, but when you wear the braids, it it knocks up the fetish thing a little bit. Cause I mean, that's my thing. Like, for me personally, I have to know that it's a preference, or I'm here for a man who's like, you know. I like all body types, but I'm cool with yours too. Or you know, or even I but what prefer if a guy women. genuinely likes your body type? Like, why right. does it have to be a fetish? What if he genuinely is attracted to women that are shaped like you? Like, okay, there could be ten women, right? Right. But the one that catches his eye, right, is a woman that's shaped like you. Just like right. there could be a man that's attracted to, let's say, big breasts, right, or Big butt, mm -hmm. or long hair, mm -hmm. or short hair, right? You know, or light skinned women, or dark skinned women, like, mm -hmm. like that. That's that. Like, my question is, when is it a fetish versus attraction? You know what I'm saying? See, I, but but I feel like, uh, see, okay, now I don't have that question for you because I feel like honestly, when you dive into the fetish lane, it's a little bit more than attraction, right? Because I mean, yeah, like. You know, again, a man can prefer my body shape and still not fetishize me. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the thing. Like, don't don't text me and be like, I want to watch you eat. Like, that's OD to me. Like, I'm not about that to be right. like, oh, right. daddy, here's a drumstick. Like, fuck that. Like, that's weird. 
But if right. a man is just like, I admire, I admire, uh, admire your body shape. I think you're beautiful. I love the way your body is. That's cool. Admiration and preference are two different things. Because I think fetish takes it up a notch. With I don't think there's anything wrong with fetishes, but when it comes to me and my weight, I personally don't want that to be the one thing that is the fetish. Right. Like you could like little slanty eyes, and that could be the right. thing for you. And I have that. And that's right. cool. But my, my nigga, you're not about to have me eating drumsticks and, and eat, ordering pizza somebody when I said, said I was full two hours ago. Somebody here said fetish is more of an addiction thing. Which I, I can kind of see what they mean by that. Like it's more of a yeah. something they can't control. Like something that, that might rule uh, them versus, I don't well, know. Quest, question for you. Do you think everyone has a fetish? Um... I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know. I don't think we can say uh, everyone, everyone has anything, you know, because mm, true. we are so diverse and so different as people right. that it's like it, I, I, I really have come to understand that um, it, just we're infinite. Like there's an infinite right. number of people on this planet and nobody is the same. Even if we right. resemble each other in thought you know, on nine out of ten things, there's probably that one thing that, that could possibly be a deal breaker. That's just that big right. and that major. Thing. Right. You know? Yeah. Because I don't think in my mind, like, I have one that comes to, like, I have preferences or, like, a what I think is, like, a type, but I don't think I right. have, like, a, oh, a if fetish. a man just has this, it's it's this for me. I don't I don't think right. I have one. Yeah. I, I can't either. I, you know, I, I can't say that. See, now listen, I got a whole list of questions for you, and we done got on a fetish and preference. You started it. You I'm, started I'm, it. Listen, listen, let me, hold on, now I got to find my, my place. Okay, wait, before we even continue, because we'll go to the left, tell everybody how they can watch The Boys, where they can see it at. Uh, on Amazon Prime mm -hmm. uh, video, Amazon Prime video. Yep, check it out, it's really good, y'all, and I'm not just saying that to say it i i really enjoyed myself this weekend binging it so now i want to talk to you about howard because obviously we connect there we're both howard alum and um even trying to do some research this weekend i realized there wasn't a lot of information that i saw kind of about um your time at howard so i think that as howard students we all know there's like this this um energy around the time that you're there, right? And like everyone has kind of has this like identity on campus, whether you like to admit it or not. So who was Laz when he was on the campus of Howard University? Were you in the mix? Was you chilling? What were you like? Cause you are you know, a school of B. I, so. Yeah. I was school of B. Business um, for everybody out there. School of business. School of business. I, you know, I wore like, I wore like Mexican ponchos. That was like my thing. I wore like Mexican Oof. ponchos. You know the those hoodie type, but they were like, like made out of like the Mexican kind of uh, cloth. Oh, we need pictures. I used to wear that. I used to wear um, like these. This guy on campus used to make these these <laughs> chains, these African head chains, and they were like clay baked African heads with like Rastafarian dreads and hats and all this stuff, like as a medallion. I used to rock that. Like I would say. My my style was kind of like uh, backpacker hip hop hip hop backpacker kind of dude. Okay, you know? were you like I didn't have a skateboard, but if I whooped one out, you wouldn't have uh, questioned. One step under, one step under. Yeah, 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 yeah. one step under. And how? Yeah. What was that response like on campus? Because like obviously, you know, ladies love you. Was that the same energy you got on campus? What was that? Nah, like? You know what? I'm gonna tell you what I loved about Howard was that. Uh, and it was a very distinct difference from my growing up in D.C. because I was born and raised in D.C. Your mother, DC, your father. Everybody. You know how it is. And D.C., the the mentality at that time, I don't know how it is now because I, I haven't lived there in so long, but the mentality at that time was you had to fit in this one very small box mm -hmm. and everybody had to dress the same Mm, the talk same, the same. Talk the same. Wear the same haircut. Mm. You know, act the same. Or you were a bama. <laughs> that was the thing. <laughs> if you did, if you weren't a carbon copy of the man next to you, John you like bama. A ja bama. Like bama. <laughs> you were a bama. When I got to Howard, it was the complete opposite. 
Mm. It was the weirder, the more different, the more unique, the more like one of one you are. Those were the people that stood out at Howard, not the people that were just like um, in uniform North alike. Yeah, mm. yeah, like uniform, like you know, polo shirt, Dockers. Those people kind of just like blended in with the student body, but right. the people that kind of stood out were those people that just didn't conform. They had their own vibe, their own thing, right? You know, and that that's what I really appreciated about Howard was that it celebrated the individual. Yeah, you know, what I'm sure. saying like Howard wasn't one of those schools where you had to join a fraternity yeah. to be hot. Yeah, for like, sure. There were plenty of people in fraternities and sororities that weren't hot. Yeah. And nobody even knew who they were. And I'm not saying being hot was that, uh, right. The but goal. It's, impo it's important. Let's, yeah. Right. But, but on campus. I'm comparing it to the type of campus where, in order for you to be hot, you had to be part of that fraternity or sorority. Right. And then all of a sudden, you're one of the stars on campus. At Howard, that didn't make you a star. Right. It didn't make you a star being on a sports team, on a football team, or a basketball team. True. That did not make you a star. Yeah. Now, if you were the star of the football team, or right, the right, star no, no, no. of the basketball, you team, had the hoes, right? <laughs> then you were a star. But if you were just on it, it did not elevate you above somebody else, right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? And so, I felt like Howard was also the type of school that, uh, like I said, it encouraged individual thinking, and yeah. it did not make you think that in order for you to get ahead, you had to be a part of anybody's group. Mm -hmm. You know, like us, uh, the, the, the individual was as celebrated as somebody who was in a group. Yeah. And so, I feel like that's important. I'm interested uh, to know, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to get caught up in this, but when Nick Cannon just got crucified for the conversation that he had, um, the people were saying we're anti-Semitic. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. When I watched it, now I did not watch for full context, so be clear, I'm going off of what I saw on the blogs, but the uh, rhetoric that he had was very similar to the conversations we had in classes at Howard. You know what I mean? So when I saw Nick get crucified, I was really um sad because one you you know from going to Howard not everybody is able to have those dialogues or is able to really become really centered with blackness and who we are in that in our real history right a lot of people have a very watered down um knowledge of what the things that we've learned and so when I saw Nick get crucified for the things he said like I said I didn't watch the whole thing so I don't I missed maybe I missed the anti-semitic parts but as far as talking about um white people in general in the manner that he did I feel like the rhetoric was something that we would talk in Dr. Carr's class or in a classroom you know on campus so when you saw that as a Howard alum um what were your thoughts um I didn't see the whole thing either yeah um and it's crazy because I saw part of it mm -hmm. I, I found out about it after it happened it became controversial mm -hmm. um because I didn't follow his podcast yeah uh on YouTube so when it became controversial, I went to go see it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was like early in the morning or something. And I saw that it was something like an hour and 45 minutes. I mean, it was a long, right. right. you know, usually podcasts are like 30 minutes, 45 right. minutes, maybe right. an hour. But this thing was like two hours. I was like, ain't no way in the world I'm going to get through this. So I, I paused it, right? Yes. I did my day. I came back, opened up my laptop, and it was still one of the tabs was that YouTube tab. Right. I went to go play it. It got removed from all YouTube channels. Dang. All, they, re they scrubbed the internet. That thing, I haven't found it on any Facebook pages. You're not about to. Or nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I couldn't hear it. Now, I know um, uh, the brother that he had on there uh, from Public Enemy. I mm -hmm. forgot what his name is. Um, S1Ws. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. Yeah, yeah, but I know you're talking about. But I know he has a, a platform where he talks a lot, you know, about mm -hmm. uh, uh, issues in the community and stuff like right. that. But, you know, he was on Nick's platform, so I guess Nick, you know, had to bear the heat mm -hmm. for the yeah. conversation. And like I said, I don't know what Nick said. What was said? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't get to see it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, the one thing that I think uh, I loved about Howard was 
I learned a lot about our history that you just don't learn ever um, in school. Yeah, and I, yeah. I mean, I grew up in in a school with all black teachers, mm. you know, but we never learned that level of history and that depth of history. And of course, you know, you're in college, so you're supposed to. Right. But I don't even think it was part of the curriculum. I just think it was part of the culture at Howard. Yep. Where, you know, you just learn. You, you learn about what's going on in the community and both historically and what's going on right now. Right. You know? And so, like, I, you know, for me, it kind of set the tone and it really amplified my, my thirst to learn more about who we are. Right, you know? right. And who Absolutely. we've been. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I learned, especially growing up in Texas. So I grew up in Texas and uh, honey in the South, they really don't want you to know nothing. Blackness is the devil out there pretty much. And right. going to Howard just opened my eyes to so much. So when I saw Nick getting crucified, I was just like, damn, it sucks because you know, the Howard experience, I think the reason that alum talk about it in the way we do is because anybody who's ever been on that campus, whether it was a year, you graduated, you came for a couple years, anybody who's somebody who came from Howard can testify to what Howard did for them. You know, and I think that it's because of what we learned and the conversations that we had and the way that our minds expanded past what we are taught um, at any other period of our lives. So um, I think that's why you know, Howard alums speak about Howard in the in the manner that we do because we've all had that common experience. Um, and speaking of Howard, you know, obviously we lost Chadwick Boseman um, a couple weeks back. And, you know, I think the black community in, in total felt lost. And then as Howard alum, we feel a loss. But then there is this, I I think as, as a Howard alum, this, um, I don't know how to describe it without saying elite, because I, I know you all don't see yourselves as that, but when we talk about Howard alum, we name the Taraji P. Hensons, we name the Chadwick Bozemans, we name the Laz Alonzos when we're having these discussions. So I know you being in Chadwick's career, um, obviously just probably touched you in a different way because you know the lifestyle, you know what it's like, and then to know what he was battling while he was doing what you know you do every day healthy so what was it like or what are kind of your thoughts on chadwick and just all that we've learned the past couple of weeks about him leading up to his passing man i'm gonna tell you uh he's one of those dudes that you know we were just talking about this friday night you could challenge anybody in town to say something bad about him mm. and you just can't get anybody to say anything bad about him you know, like, it's just one of those few people that somehow, you know, just gave off no bad vibes, no bad energy. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I wasn't friends with him, but I got to meet him a few times and um, always a very polite a gentleman, um, classy, mm. you know what I'm saying? Uh and and you appreciate that in our business you know what i'm saying right. it's like when you meet somebody and you can tell that they don't have any like the you 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 have the in the exchange and the interaction and right. you just feel like a genuine hello not with yeah. any ulterior motives or shade or anything like that mm -hmm. you know so it's a big loss i think not just for um the acting community but also for howard yeah. Because, you know, he's definitely one of our greats. Yeah, you know? for sure. And I feel like we have greats in so many different fields. Right. Um, not just entertainment. You know, of course, mm -hmm. entertainment is who we who we find out about because right, of, right. of our jobs. But politics. You know, all my, yeah. I mean, my friends from Howard uh, are extremely successful, as successful mm -hmm. as people that I work with in entertainment. And nobody right. knows them who they are, like, you know, right. as far as audiences, but they are tremendously successful. You know, mm -hmm. so I think I think we are a, um, you know, a, 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 a very rich breeding ground yeah, for, for black sure. excellence. Yeah, for, for sure. black excellence. And, and he was one of the shining beacons of, you know, our black excellence, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I... It, again, you feel a certain sense of loss, right? Because what he meant to the community as Black people, we had our first real Black superhero, you know what I mean? And it wasn't watered down and it was for us. And 
you know, then to be a Howard alum. And then I think just going back to like the breeding grounds and what it cultivates and just hearing him speak. And you can tell that even his time, even his speech when he came back and did the commencement address, you know, just like what ha Howard had done to create who the Chadwick Boseman that we got the honor to see um, had shaped him. So it was just a really, really, really sad And moment. I also feel that like, you know, that film, um, Black Panther bridged such an important gap between black people internationally. Mm. Because, you yeah. know, at that moment that Black Panther came out, every black, every black person on the planet yeah. that saw that movie identified yep. with the film and with the story and with whatever version of blackness told their story in that movie, right. they identified, yeah. you know, it was it's universal. True. And so I feel like that was a very beautiful, um, you know, poetic <laughs> piece. It was an art piece. That movie yeah. is an art piece. And, you know, where they go from here is going to be very interesting. Very but, interesting. But, you know, I think that it's going to be whatever they decide to do to honor Chad in that movie, it's going to be a tearjerker. There will not be a dry yeah. eye in that Ooh, child. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I'm going to have to see that one on, by myself. Right, right, right. Yeah. Sit the all the way cause... in the back. Sit all the way in the back. Have my little Kleenex box. Yeah. You know, have my yeah. hoodie on so people don't right, see Right, right, right. Be real low key because yeah. it's going to be hard. It is. Man. Yeah, and I'm interested to see how Disney moves because if they make the wrong decision, they will surely regret. Yeah, but I don't think they're going to make the wrong decision because I think uh, uh, the director... Uh, yeah, Ryan... Ryan Coogler is going to make sure that the right he's honored correctly. Yeah. Seeing, seeing the behind the scenes of what he did to prepare for the first one mm. and how many visits he made to Africa and how much of that movie was his prior trips doing research for the film. Yeah. How much of that he implemented in the cloth and in the textiles and the colors he used and, yeah. you know, all of that. And so uh, I think that they have a more than capable team mm -hmm. to make sure that it, everything is done right. And he also set a very high bar for himself. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I know he is gonna he is gonna definitely meet that bar and exceed it. Mm -hmm. You know, because he he's the one who set it. So yeah, it's gonna be know. crazy. Yeah, that's that's his that's his bar. Yeah. You know, and so it, he's gonna put he's gonna he's gonna leave it all on the court. Mm -hmm. when it comes to making that, that second film. And I'm sure his castmates that. feel the responsibility as well to to oh, really yeah. show up oh, for, they're gonna be for Chad. On fire. Yeah, they're going to be on fire. But I can't wait for a war season. Yeah, they're all amazing actors anyway. So mm -hmm. when you take all amazing actors and put them in one Movie. film, <laughs> right. it's like the dream team. It really yeah. is like the And that's how I felt watching it. Everything one. is firing on all cylinders. Everybody is working at their highest level because mm -hmm. it's easy. You know, right. it's it's harder to work downward than mm -hmm. when you bring all people on one level. Then now it's like, oh, I don't need no look passes. It's all no look passes and three. You know, <laughs> right. sport because you, it's like the globe trotters. You're not even thinking at that point. It's everybody and and everybody in that film is literally tier one actors. Everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and that movie also bridged the gap, too, I think, for Hollywood. I think right now we're watching as, like, these huge major studios after the success of Black Panther financially and at award season, how well it did and how Black people turned out. Because let's be clear, our, our dollar is the most powerful in the country. And when we turned that, that movie out, I think these big ne networks were like, okay, let's give a Black person money here and let's, let's put a Black person in the leading role here. So not only was it that for our people, but it really gave people like you and other Black actors and actresses and people of color in general, we've just the crazy rich Asians, like all these movies are now starting to be uh, put on the forefront because of Black Panther, so you know. But I think that whether... the real, I think that the real win in Black Panther is seeing a black writer and director be mm. able to take on a film of that magnitude right. and make that much huge commercial success. Mm -hmm. You know, because we always focus on the people in front of the camera, which is important. Right. You know, I mean, focusing on, you know, the actors is by all means they're on your poster. Right. But 
when you start seeing creators mm -hmm. playing on you know the highest level it it really sends a different you know message that we are bankable on all fronts on all we fronts, can right? write yeah we can write you know 100 billion dollar movies mm -hmm. you know we can direct a billion dollar movie you know grossing right. movie you know we can star in a billion dollar grossing movie Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it tells multiple stories, not just the actor story, but the writers, the producers, the directors, mm -hmm. the PAs, the lighting guys, the, you know, the sound guys, you right. know, the, the effects guys, you know. Um, and so I, I think that that's the broader story that mm -hmm. hopefully will open up more doors in the business. Right. Well, and, and speaking of creatively, you know, you, besides being an actor, directed, produced. So now that you are advancing, because let's be clear, this man been in the game 20 years plus, you know, I mean, doing his thing. So what for you now that you're getting um, well into your career? What like what are what is your your thing? Like, are you still big on acting? Do you want to focus more or do you want to just be a jack of all trades? No, nah, uh, acting is still my number one passion. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to create more. It, it excites mm -hmm. me to be able to tell a story from beginning mm -hmm. to end and, and not just interpret somebody else's story, right. but me be able to tell a story through other actors you know, mm -hmm. where I can give them the material and now they can bring it to life. Right. You know, the same way I bring somebody else's material to life. Right. So for me, I think that, I think it's a natural transgress, you know, a natural progression in this business mm -hmm. is to you know go from acting to now doing a little more stuff behind the scenes mm -hmm. you know and uh it, it really comes down to uh when when that becomes as much fun as acting mm -hmm. you know because acting is fun i mean <laughs> it really is a fun job now it's hard work it's painful you're on your feet for you know 12 15 hours a day and mm -hmm. you got to do a lot of stuff uncomfortable stuff that you know at times it's like ridiculous but when you do yeah i mean you know you got to shoot a scene soaking wet in negative you know 15 degrees you know at a river right you know what i'm saying like and you're doing it you know for 15 hours in one mm -hmm. day you know like that those things are just not those those moments you're not having fun you know what i'm saying every moment ain't fun but, you know, when you're doing something that you love and you really want it to, to turn out great, that overrides the fact Everything that sometimes else. you do stuff that sucks, yeah. So I have a question. Um, this, this just popped in my mind as you were talking, and, you know, I just go to the left. Um, what is shooting a sex scene like? Because obviously there's a thousand people in the room. How uncomfortable or comfortable are you? Because obviously it's your job, but, like, obviously emulating sex with someone is is... Is, is interesting. I've always wanted to know from an actor. I mean, I think it's like different. That. Yeah, I think it's different for everybody. Mm. For me, it's extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> because you're so self-conscious, you know, like, nobody behaves that way when they're having sex. You know, you're right. literally performing <laughs> for the camera. And so, uh, you know, you're self-conscious about how you look. You're self-conscious about the angles that that might be getting, you're self-conscious mm -hmm. on, you know, does this look sexy or do I look whack? Do I look stupid? You know, uh, is she okay? Am I going right. too far? Am, you know, like, does yeah. this look real? Are you, you know, are you all right? You know, like you ask, are you all right? Like a hundred times because you want to make sure that, you know, okay. you know yeah, I mean, okay. you got to make sure that they're still okay with what's happening. Um, and then, you know, I mean, I, listen, I have never liked those things. Mm, okay. I do not like set scenes in movies because it's just it's too artificial. Like it's too, it's work. It's really hard work, and uh, it stresses me out. How long do the, they shoot those? Like, is it a very quick thing? It really depends on you know uh, the scene itself, how it's written, how far the director wants to go, um, the nature of the scene. Um, but then you know, like even like the clothes you have to wear, like you know these draws that look like you know they're tight and it's just it's weird it's, it's, it's just a lot it's, it's whack a lot. yeah it's super, <laughs> whack. it's super whack i'm not gonna lie there was some nudity in the boys and i was like last no trying. that wasn't me no there it wasn't you i'm just saying was your seat was your time coming 
Oh no, I better not come. Nah. <laughs> Mother's milk, he don't. Mother's milk, I think keeps his clothes on, man. Oh, okay, cause I, I was just like, I keep seeing this nudity disclaimer. People are like, I, but where does it go? Yeah, people want to know. I saw that comment. Somebody said, where, where does the like? How does that happen? They, they want to know. They have these drawers. They have this underwear that, like, literally is super thick, and it hold it. It literally packs everything down. Like, oh. it's, they're like, uh, they're like. Um, Spanx. Hmm. They're almost like Spanx. But, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you layer them. So you'll wear like two or three of them sometimes. You know, just so that there's no, there's no touching. Yeah. yeah, there's no touching, no misunderstanding. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very weird, yeah. It's whack. I've always wanted to know because I saw Issa Rae for the comment because the bold and the beautiful had their actors making out with mannequins because of COVID and Issa was like, oh, I can't wait to fuck a mannequin. <laughs> oh, my like, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then like, you know, you're always chewing gum because you don't want to offend the other person. That's just kissing scenes in general. You mm. know, you, you're always down in like Lysol. I mean, not Lysol. Um, uh, Listerine. Listerine and, mm -hmm. and mouthwash and brushing your teeth and you don't eat certain things. Like, you're not going to eat onions if you have a kissing scene that day or garlic or anything like you, that. You really got to think about this. This is you really. You got to think about all that. Because, like, you can't show up for a kissing scene and you just had a, a onion sandwich. Yeah, you, you know? don't want to be on the shade room because Laz yeah, Alonzo would have them. Yeah, you would. It, it'd be, they couldn't work. They wouldn't be able to work. You know, um, you, have to be, you have to be thoughtful of the other person and, you know, Make sure that your mouth is at its utmost highest level of hygiene and you didn't eat certain things that day and you know, and if you have a and if you have a, a sex scene, you haven't eaten anything that day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you better yeah. hope it's the first scene of the day. Because if it's the last scene of the day, more than likely, you know, you gotta be shirt off and mm -hmm. if you put in your stomach, you It'll know, your stomach out a little bit. So you're trying to be as flat as possible and as ripped as possible and same thing with women you know you don't want anything that's gonna make your stomach look like you got a little something um because then you will end up in the shade room and get toe up you yeah know? yeah so you probably don't eat at all that day like that day you don't eat you might drink water you drink coffee you know but maybe having y'all asses ready food. to pass out trying to get a yeah. vaccine 100 percent, 100 percent. so it's no fun it's not fun it ain't, it ain't, it ain't what, no. yeah. No. Yeah. Well, I oh, always yeah. felt like kissing scenes, like, so I'm the type of person who watches shows in general, and I always think about how awkward this must feel to watch something with no music. Like, I went to the set of How to Get Away with Murder, and watching the scenes with no music, I was like, this is so interesting, because music and editing adds so much feel to shit. So, like, it I does. can't imagine kissing somebody 30 times in, like, a five-minute increment to get a kiss right, and it's just hella awkward. And we're back. And kiss again, well, and we're back. Well, that's funny because, like, when I did Jump in a Broom with Paula Patton, mm -hmm. um, the first scene her and I ever shot in life, not just in that movie, but in life, we had just met. <laughs> We, I had never met her before. Right. We had just met like two days before um, for the table read. Yikes. And after that, you know, she had just had her baby. And so she, after the table read, her and Robin got up and left because she wanted to get back to her baby. So I might have said like two words to her. And the first scene that we ever shot together was the very last scene in the movie on the bridge. <laughs> when we get back together again and we have to like rush each other and like tongue kiss, like our lives depended on it. You oh. know? And like mm. the first time, the first like maybe two or three takes, I remember seeing Tracy Edmonds, <laughs> uh, who was the executive producer of the film along with T.D. Jakes. Um, I don't know if he was there, but I think his wife may have been there that day. They all like went into a huddle with the director. And they look real worried. Ooh. And they were terrified because they were like, they don't have no chemistry. They were like, they're kissing like they're brother and sister. Like, uh, there's nothing there. Oh, my you God. Know? Yeah. And so, you know, Celine pulled me to the side and he was like, look, man, you know, I need you to really, like, 
like kiss this girl uh, yeah like you finally got your girl back and we sat there and we talked <laughs> you know and like you know i had to think about i had to basically re reread the script in my head of everything that we went through to get to, to... get to that moment because you know the first day we hadn't established any chemistry right right we, just... even, we barely knew each other you know we hadn't established that trust Mm. And we didn't have any rehearsals because she had just had a baby. Mm. So there were no rehearsals. There were no jokes. There were no, like, you know, little things yeah. that make you feel comfortable so that when you do get on set, you've worked the bugs off. You've gotten the rust right. off. And it's like, all right, I trust this person at least right. at a bare minimum. I trust them on screen. Right. We didn't have that time. And so it looked really whack until... <laughs> They pulled us to the side, and I saw Tracy having a little conversation with Paula, and Salim was on the other side having a little conversation with me. And then when we both came, you know, we looked at each other, and we were like, all right, are we going to do this? And she like, was like, let's do this. And like, come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like, all right, here we go. And, you know, we, we each put, like, our little, like, music in our headphones, and she was on one side of the set, and I was on another side, just kind of like, <laughs> like, trying to get to where we could make we it work. basically guess, yeah where our emotional roller coaster went through and right. where we are emotionally at this point. And so right. it was, it was, we, we got it. Obviously nobody would have ever known. I'm about to go back and watch this movie this weekend. Cause I, I love the tea. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's it was crazy. Tough. That first day was rough. That's great. And you know, everybody loves drum the broom child. Everybody love it. Yeah. That's a good one. Okay. So listen, let me, let me see where I'm back. Cause we be getting off track. Um, Okay, and, and speaking of projects, I do want to know, what is your process um, as a Black actor um, with choosing projects? Like, are there things that you turn down just because you, you're not doing that? Or um, is it part of the hustle and grind? Because you've played a little bit of everything in your 20 yeah, years. Yeah, so. I do. I turn down projects that, um, let me, for, for different reasons. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. there's no one reason. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a character that I feel... Um, is a is a is a caricature, not a character. Mm. Meaning, uh, it doesn't really have any structural depth. Substance. It's yeah. just surface. Like, okay, he's a bad guy. Mm -hmm. and everything he does is bad. He everything he does is evil. Right. There's no good qualities. There's no struggle. There's no backstory as to why he's this way. He's just bad. Mm -hmm. You know, and he just gets worse. Mm -hmm. That that to me isn't isn't stretching. It isn't interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I prefer not to, uh, yeah, pr uh, pr pr put myself in situations where I don't feel like this is going to be something I'm excited about. Right. Right. You know, Makes sense. um, and then, you know, I mean, if it's something that might paint our people in a bad light, like that means a lot to me, you know, to not participate in that in any way. Um, if it's something that, uh, I mean, you know, there's there's a million reasons why you might I say would no. and why I wouldn't. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But more than anything, I'm just gonna say, if the material makes me feel like I can't bring truth to that role, yeah, then I'm not gonna do it because I have to absolutely always bring truth to the performance. Otherwise, I'm I'm gonna feel whack, mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel whack. Yeah, about what I do. Yeah. That, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Okay, so I was watching your interview, um, your last interview you did before COVID took over, and you were on the podcast um, with Melissa Ford, and you had said in blue, and you had said that in 2020, one of the things you wanted to work on was being a life coach. How has that uh, transpired for you? Are you still trying to do Yo, that? Or 2020? I need a life coach. I need a 2020 life coach. Okay. All that stuff I said in that podcast has gone out the window in 2020. I need a therapist, a life coach, a psychiatrist, a trainer, a gym, a chef, a cooking teacher. Like it. This has been this has been a wild year. But it humbles yeah, the no. hell out of all of us. Oh man. Oh, su super super humble. Um. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I do want to be a life coach uh, still. Okay. Um, 
I got a lot of practice in 2020. <laughs> okay. With my friends and my circle of friends and my tribe. Um, but I enjoy that, honestly. Like, I enjoy... Mm -hmm. First of all, I appreciate that there are people that value my opinion mm -hmm. enough to where when they're in a time of crisis, I'm one of the people they call. They call, yeah. So that to me is um, is, is special. It means something to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, I want to be able to, to help people in a way, in the best way possible. Like, you know, there are some things that being a life coach teaches you that, you know, just being somebody with good advice might not necessarily have right, all the same. tools yeah. to help in every situation. So, yeah, I, I wanted to do that. And I still, it's still something that interests me. Okay. Now, some of the other things that you said um, is, is we are celebrating our wins. If you want to do that more, you want to learn to be a little more flexible in doing so. Look, see, you already got the little disgruntled. Because mm -mm. I didn't celebrate at all this COVID. There was First no of all, celebration. you survived a whole global pandemic. Like, do you know that everybody cannot say that? Bruh, you got the number one show on Amazon and it's out for a new season right now? Come on, brother. Just check me. Go ahead, check Come me. Come on, brother. Me. Snap me. Snap Come me back. Come on. Nah, and you I'm still look 30. You, you still look 30. You, I'm going to tell you what means the most to me. What means the most to me is my family. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, there are people that are really out there struggling with this thing. Yeah. And sick, you know, and fighting this thing. And uh, I don't take that for granted at all. I talk a lot of smack about, you know, oh, you know, I want to work out, what the hell, like this, what is going on, all this mm -hmm. stuff. But at the end right. of the day, uh, what you said is 100% right. And I'm yeah. grateful. I'm extremely grateful. I don't take it for granted. But I, but I also am, am blessed you know, that I can say that, you know, thank God we are surviving this thing. And I'm praying mm -hmm. that, you know, that we all survive this thing. And yeah. Get through it. You know, and get through Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, and you, my Howard brother, and I'm always going to pour into my Howard family because you deserve your roses. So um, before we play this game that I came up with, I do want to ask you, because I think it's important, um, just with how flighty life is, you know, what does Laz Alonzo want to be remembered for? What do you, when people talk about you when you're mm. not here anymore, what do you want them to say? You know what? I, I, I don't, I don't want to fill in that blank. Mm. I don't want to fill in that blank. I want, I want my work and my impact to fill that blank in, you know? So I know I have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. so that if I'm, if that were to happen before you, you could say, I remember mm -hmm. Laz Alonzo for X, but I don't mm -hmm. want to be the one to say what that should be. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I just, mm -hmm. I just have to challenge myself to make enough of a difference so that when that day comes, because it's going to come for all of us, right. you know, I've done enough to where people can say, can fill in that blank. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I have nothing but good things to say in my blank. So just thank you. Know. Thank you. You're welcome. So, okay. I came up with a game and it's called, it's called what, what's the latest with last. And so basically you're just going to tell me the latest of these things. So like, what's the latest movie you watched? The latest movie. Oh man. Um, I mean, series I've been watching American horror story. Oh, I love American horror stories. Love Thanks. it. I am Let obsessed it. with that right now. I, I can't believe I've gone this long without ever. Oh, you just started. I just started. Did you have you? Are you watching in order? Have you or are you going? No, out of order? I'm watching it out of order. I finished uh, the eight. Covenant. Have you yeah, watched the Covenant? No, Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Dog, watch the Covenant. When I tell you, Angela Bassett acted her okay. ass off. Because I heard Hotel was good too. Hotel is good, but I'm telling you, the Covenant I'm, is about black so witches. Do the Covenant like, next. Do the Covenant next. Gotta go, right, and, then, the and then tell me what you think. All right, cool. Because A, Apocalypse was beyond insane. Oh, they're wild. Every I season. Every season. Yeah. Every they season. are brilliant on that show. The acting, the writing, the directing, the storytelling. Like they're everything. supposed to be getting into it. She be getting busy. Oh, man, what a great show. What a great show. So I'm a huge fan of that now. Um, movie. I haven't really watched a movie lately. You've been binging the shows. I've just been on shows. Yeah, I've been on, you know, I've been to being home. Mm -hmm. uh, I've just been watching series, <laughs> mostly series. Okay. All right. I can't wait to watch Lovecraft. Uh, 
Oh, I heard uh, Journey has been acting. That's what I've heard. I haven't watched, she but I heard. Crazy, she always Yeah, crazy. she's been serving us since she was a kid, so. Yeah, but that's going to be, I, I'm excited to see that because I like that genre. Uh, yeah, I, I love horror, like, the, yep. the Jordan Peele-esque. Yep. That's, that's exactly. my ish. That's Fantasy my ish. Fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah. Stuff, so I can't wait to watch that. Yeah, you need to be in a horror film, but just don't let them let you die. You got to you gotta Man, make it. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> that ain't your testimony? Man, we always the first to go in a horror movie. Well, that's why you got to be in a Jordan Peele. That was another right, thing you manifested at that's the top true. of the year. You did manifest that in that yeah. episode. Right, right, right. So that's so we true. still speaking at Jordan. When we play yeah. it back, remember that. Okay? That's right, Jordan Peele. All right. Um, what's, who's the latest celebrity crush you have? Or is that weird because those are like your colleagues? Yeah, those are my colleagues, but you know, I don't really have a celebrity crush. Okay. I don't have a celebrity crush. I've always thought uh, Rihanna was was very bad beautiful. as hell. Yeah, beautiful bad. and mysterious, and mm -hmm. but down to earth and cool. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, to me, a crush is like you right. know, like you get butterflies and all that. I don't yeah. like to me. What gives me butterflies is actual chemistry. Mm. You know, admire somebody from afar, that don't, that don't give me butterflies. It's actual, like, if we have a chemistry, then mm -hmm. I'll have a crush. Then you feeling it. Then you feeling it. Okay. Yeah, I got to feel it. Gotta well, feel my it. next one was, what has been your latest turn on? So, great segue. Latest turn on? Like, what, what is doing it for lads these days? Uh, probably, I don't, you know what? I don't know. I mean... I haven't thought about it. If, it, mm -hmm. if it's changed, I mean, twenty twenty eight been that dry for you, sir? Has it? No, it's not. <laughs> you silly, hey man, trying to be COVID free. Listen, I I feel you on that because listen, man, you gotta you gotta be careful. You gotta worry there. about two things now. That Catch Rona, two things. yeah, that Rona, she ain't discriminating. Auntie Rona is not playing games, man. Nah, but uh, you know, I, I just think in general. Uh, like I said, I have to feel it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I just have to feel it. Like, there's no... I think when you try to intellectualize attraction and compatibility, mm -hmm. then, you know, you, you create a list that at the end of the day, you either feel it or you don't. Mm -hmm. That, you know, when that umph hits you, that umph is there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, oh, this is going to be bad. Right. You know, you already know, like, oh, man, oh, no, 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 no. This is going to be too good, which could be either great or horrible. Like, right. you know, let me, let me check myself because I can easily get caught up in the situation. Right. You know, you just hope it's, it's not an entanglement. You know, you hope it's just, you never know. You could get entangled. It, you know? We're going to talk about that later because I got My questions for you, but we're going to talk about that later. We're going to talk about that later because, anyway. But listen, live is about to kick me off because we done hit our hour. So, so again, everybody make sure All right. you go watch The Boys. Um, it's on Amazon the Prime. The Boys on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so and, much uh, for thank you. platform with me. Thank you for coming on it. You know, listen, yeah. there's always a space for you at the Lemonade Stand, okay? You always show me love. You always reach out. And I really appreciate you. You've always, since we met, you've always Absolutely. shown me a tremendous amount of support and love. And, and I, that doesn't go unnoticed. So thank you for, for always supporting my career. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah. Yes. All y'all all last uh, lovers, make sure y'all follow me too, at Leah A. Henry. But anyway, all right, guys, thank you so much, boo. All right. Have a good one, mama. You too. Thank you. Peace. All right. Bye-bye.